The Democratic Republic of Congo DRC and the then Zaire has from 1965 to 1997 has faced an economic and political crisis since its independence from the colonial rule. The war claimed up to 6 million lives, either as a direct result of fighting or because of disease and malnutrition. The United Nations has reported human rights violations committed by the parties at issue, including sexual violence and looting. M23 rebels have also reported recruited children into armed conflict. Our guest in our program is Séverine Hautser, Assistant Professor of Political Science, specializing in international relations and African studies at Barnard College, Columbia University, United States. She has been in the DRC for many times. Professor Otser, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for inviting me. What are the roots of the conflict in the DRC? Well, there are many routes, and uh, if you want to think about them, to me, it's very, it's easier to think about them at the local level, national level, mm -hmm. and regional or international level. So it's a superposition of different conflicts, local conflicts that have been ongoing since the early 90s in the eastern Congo. So people fighting over land, over political power, over economic resources, and really uh, in their villages or, or among individuals or at the level of the district. And then on top of that, in the mid-90s, you had a classic civil war mm -hmm. where uh, different rebel groups were trying to seize power over the entire country. And in addition to that, you had an international war with um, neighboring armies uh, mm -hmm. and rebel groups from uh, neighboring countries coming to Congo and starting fighting on Congolese territory and allying with local and national Congolese rebel groups. So it's really a superposition of very different root causes, um, mm. and that has resulted in the deadliest conflict since World War II. So it's very, a very, very important conflict. Ms. Otzer, was the ongoing war for an economic or political side? It's both, I would say. Um, people talk a lot about the economic causes of violence in Congo, and especially uh, everybody talks about the looting of mineral resources, of diamond, of gold, coltan, cassiterite. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is another very important economic uh, goal in, in the violence, and it's securing control of our land. Uh, land is still, ownership of land is still very important in Congo because land provides uh, the main means of survival to many Congolese rural families. If you don't have land, basically, you don't have anything to eat, you can't survive, and your family can't survive. Exactly. And uh, on, so it's, it's extremely important. And on mm. top of that, it usually interacts with, uh, with competition for political power. So either political power, you know, governmental power, but also political power in a village or in a province. Because when you have control over the political machine, then you control the distribution of land. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you have land and resources, then you can help recruit fighters that will help you secure political power. So it's, it's very linked. Well, who are the groups fighting for that land? There are mostly local militias, mm. so local armed groups that were created very often as self-defense groups um, and then evolved into, um, into standard armed militias. Mm -hmm. And then you have bigger rebel groups like the M23 that you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Well, speaking about the uh, local militias, well, tell us uh, about the M23, the FDLR rebels and the Hutu militias. Sure. So the M23, it's a former Congolese armed group. Mm -hmm. Officially, it has been transformed into a political party. Um, but there are still rumors that they are recruiting uh, and that they are preparing to fight again. We don't know if that's true or not. Then mm -hmm. you have the FDLR that you mentioned. And the FDLR are a Rwandan rebel Hutu militia. Mm -hmm. And what's notable about this armed um, group is that they include some of the people who are responsible for the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And they are notorious not only for that, but also for, uh, for using a lot of violence against Congolese populations uh, of the Eastern Congo. And uh, then you have many other... Um, 
uh, foreign rebel groups and Congolese armed groups. So the Congolese armed groups are usually called Mai Mai, uh, the local mm-hmm. militias. So the Mai Mai are, again, the self-defense militias that uh, usually fight for local things. So, for example, to control land or to control a specific village, a specific district, a specific territory. Mm-hmm. Well, the United Nations and international community have tried to settle the conflict. The UN and AU jointly guaranteed the ongoing MONUSCO peacekeeping mission. Why have international efforts to end violence in the DRC failed? There are many reasons, uh, but one of the central reasons in my analysis is because the international efforts have failed to address local conflicts. Uh, when you look at the effort by uh, the United Nations, the African Union, uh, other donors and, and international organizations, you see that most of them focus on resolving the national and the international conflicts. So they organize a lot of you know, big conferences, they talk with the lead, they organize the general elections, and you know, all of these things that matter for national and international leaders and for the elite. But mm-hmm. in fact, uh, all of these peace builders pay very little attention to local conflicts, to the conflicts that are ongoing in villages, the conflict over land, the conflict over local power. Uh, there is very little resources and, and, and very little energy spent on these local conflicts. And it's very problematic because these local conflicts fuel the national and international violence. So mm-hmm. if you forget to address these local conflicts, then you cannot build sustainable peace in Congo. Ms. Otel, how can you describe the situation in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the south of Kivu? Uh, well, it's a very um, sad and worrisome situation. Uh, so South Kivu is one of the provinces in eastern Congo, and uh, there is violence, a lot of ongoing violence uh, in South Kivu and, and, and in the other provinces. So what mm-hmm. that means is that every day you have massive human rights violations. Uh, and also you have extreme poverty in, uh, in these eastern provinces. They are really much poorer than uh, other parts of Congo. And on top of that, you don't have a functioning army and a functioning police force. Um, so so it's, it's a situation where people uh, live in conditions of extreme destitution and uh, many of them have been victims of violence or are afraid for their life very often. And how is it different from the capital, Kinshasa? Kinshasa is, first, it's, it's richer from my point of view. You have better infrastructures, you have better hospitals, for example, or clinics, a road, uh, you have more jobs, so mm-hmm. it's, it's less Um, And also, you don't have war-related violence in Kinshasa. Uh, Last time you had uh, really war-related violence in Kinshasa was, I think, in 1997. So it was a long time ago. Now, the violence that you have is mostly uh, political violence uh, Mm -hmm. between uh, the political opposition and the Congolese government. The Congolese government usually clamping down on the political opposition. But you don't have all of these local militias and these rebel armies armed groups that you have in the eastern part of Congo. Well, coming back to the eastern Congo, what would be the repercussions of such violence? Well, let's imagine that you're living there. Um, Mm -hmm. Imagine that you know your your village or your city might be attacked at any time by uh, by armed groups, and armed groups that usually target the population when they take over a village or a city. So um, they're going to be, you know that if the armed groups enter your village or your city, there's going to be looting. Very often they will use violence against you and your family, so women are very likely to be raped, Uh, men are likely to be killed or to be tortured or to be beaten down mm-hmm. um, and, and so it's first people are living in fear very often and then the second thing is that because violence has been ongoing for so long uh, mm-hmm. now everybody in the eastern provinces has lost a relative a close relative or a close friend so many of my friends have lost uh, a father a brother a mother a sister a wife a husband a cousin you know someone sad, very very yeah. close to you um, and and then people also are struggling economically uh, it's very difficult to find a job it's very difficult to find employment it's very difficult to find the resources or the money or the land that you need to feed yourself and feed your family 
What should the Southern African Development Community, SADC, an international conference on the Great Lakes region, do to settle the crisis in the eastern part? Well, they should help support local conflict resolution. So what they're doing now uh, is that they work on international and national reconciliation, and that's very important. So they should continue to do that. But in addition, they should support programs to help resolve the local conflicts that we were talking about. And when I say, and I really say support the programs. So uh, I don't think that uh, the United Nations, the SADC, or uh, the ICGR, mm-hmm. or all of these international organizations, they can't go in a village and say, we're going to resolve the conflicts for you. Uh, because they, they don't know about local conflicts. They don't know the actors. They don't know what's at stake. But what they, what they should do is support people who know, local Congolese actors who, who would know how to resolve the conflicts, but they lack resources. They lack financial and logistic resources, and they're always asking for that. So international actors should provide uh, logistical and financial support to these actors. And sometimes local Congolese peace builders tell me that they need some diplomatic support. They need, you know, some uh, someone to help negotiate with the big armed leader or with the government or with the big, big rebel leader. So um, the African Union, mm-hmm. uh, the SADC and so on and so forth, they can help us to negotiate with these uh, national actors. Well, let's talk about the displaced. According to UN figures, right. over 2.6 million people are displaced. What will be the international response to international displacements? Well, of course, you can have a humanitarian response. So, uh, and that's what we have now, which is uh, helping the displaced people with food, with blankets, with uh, coal, with any things that they need to survive, um, and sometimes helping the host families too, because uh, because hosting displaced people is, is a burden on the host families, especially when the host families are very poor, as happened in his Eastern Congo. Mm-hmm. But to me, the most important thing is is really to address the causes of the violence. To me, the displaced people are consequences of violence and helping them with humanitarian aid is great, but it's even more important to enable them to go back home and to resume normal life. And for them to go back home and resume normal life, you need to end the violence that has forced them to flee their home. Ms. Otser, what are the challenges for both the government in place and the international community to put an end to the conflict? There are many challenges. Uh, we need a lot of resources. We need a lot of political will. We need a lot of efforts. Uh, but I think the most important challenge is that we need to change the peace building approach. Uh, and we need to pay more attention to local conflicts and local conflict resolution. Currently, the approach is that we're trying to resolve the conflict from the top down. So again, working with the Congolese government, with the neighboring governments, with the major rebel leaders. And yeah. this is important but we also need to start working more with local peace builders and with local armed groups because these local armed groups are responsible for a lot of violence and a lot of tension and a lot of instability in the Eastern Congo. Well, speaking about peace builders, let's move on to your contribution on your research. In July 2014, you published a book under the title Peace Land, Conflict Resolution and the Everyday Politics of International Intervention. Can we speak about personal reflections of a peace builder, Ms. Otser? Yes, to, to a certain extent, it's personal rep- reflections on what I did when, when I work as a peace builder or as a humanitarian aid worker uh, 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. But it's also the result of 10 years of research on international peace building. Was it a call for awakening? It, it is, yes. It is a call for awakening. Um, it's, it's meant, the book is meant to make international peace builders realize that uh, what they view as uh, everyday mundane routines that are banal, that have no influence on, yeah. uh, on their work, these are actually very important things that have a lot of influence on whether or not peace building efforts can be successful. And so basically what I'm saying in the book is that yeah. things like uh, with 
whom you want to have tea or with whom you have lunch or dinner after work, uh, who you mm-hmm. interact with, how you speak to people, how you collect information on violence, who you speak to, how you speak to yeah. them, yeah. how you ensure your securities, all of these are everyday decisions that matter as much for the success of peace building as things like high level negotiations, financial resources and political interests. Severine Otser, Assistant Professor of Political Science, specializing in international relations and African studies at Barnard College, Columbia University, United States. Thank you for being with us.